have to uh, streaming. Hi, everybody. Oh, my goodness. It is such a joy to be with you all. And thank you for a fantastic episode. Another fantastic episode. Um, I'm Laura Flanders, and I get to be joined today with uh, my co-host, Sarah Lomax-Reese at WURD in Philly. Saida Pagan, who you just saw in our episode from Palabra, um, which is a project of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, and Dr. Guthrie Ramsey, who was so moving in this episode. I mean, the stories that you told, Dr. Ramsey, have lingered with me all week. Um, and I do have to say that this talk of joy and pain is taking place also on Pride Weekend, which is also a, a moment of joy and pain as we watch the the exuberant joy of liberation movements get quickly commodified um, and commercialized by uh, corporate culture. This is the place we're all playing in, isn't it? Um, but let's start with you, Sarah. Was there anything you wanted to, to share of your week uh, since this was aired that maybe resonated with the topics at hand? And, and how did your Black Music Month go at WURD? Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, this was a wonderful uh, episode to produce and to curate um, because there's so much that we cover that is painful, that is deeply traumatic and um, difficult. And we have a responsibility to, um, to, to, to do that work on a daily basis. Um, just today, I, I read a story about a, a black man who was incarcerated for 34 years Un, um, you know, unfairly, he unjustly, and he just got out of, of prison losing, you know, 30 plus years of his life. And so there's, there's a lot of joy and pain right there that we have to, that, that we have to express um, on WURD in the black community. Um, and so, you know, doing, being intentional about talking about arts and culture and music and things that affirm us and uplift us is, is really deeply uh, gratifying and inspiring. And, you know, we did a partnership with a, a publication called Reasons to be Cheerful, which is David Burns um, from the Talking Heads, his, his publication. And we shared our, our um, Black Music Month vignettes and they amplified them through video. And one of the things that happened, we, um, Good Times by Sheik was one of the stories, one of the songs that we featured and Niall Rogers, who is from Sheik, retweeted it and so that was a high point for me this oh, yeah. week is that you know some of our work in celebrating these iconic songs of freedom and celebration um were embraced by the the creators of that music as well oh that's so great Niall was once my guest on air america fantastic guy great stories to tell i'm talking about stories to tell saida while we were in the quote-unquote zoom green room um you talked about your own on-screen television and, and media, movie work. You want to fill us in a little bit about that? You were very humble, not to mention it during the actual program. That's true. It just never came up. Yes, I am a contributor for print journalism for Palabra, but most of my career has been as a television newscaster. I am uh, originally from New York. I left New York as a young lady. My husband and I drove cross country and I have reported in Colorado Springs, Colorado, Hartford, Connecticut, for many years in Los Angeles, a little bit on the network. And uh, luckily I've been fortunate in that uh, about, oh, 30 years ago, I got an opportunity to appear as a reporter or anchor in a television show, if you remember Cagney and Lacey. Oh, and yeah. yes, and that was my first break. And after that, uh, to date, I have done 45 television episodes and 10 movies. Uh, the, most com the most commonly <laughs> viewed is Bruce Almighty. I'm 45 minutes into the movie. So when we were talking about In the Heights and we were talking about the arts, I have uh, an interesting perspective because I've been in all of those and now I do some entertainment reporting for Palabra and I get a chance to interview some very, very interesting people and they have given me some insight as to what's going on. Uh, I talked to, uh, for example, recently, Edward James Olmos. And on a congressional level, uh, the uh, representative from Texas, uh, Representative Castro, about his take on many things. So mm -hmm. I thought I would just mention that, that I do have a little personal knowledge, shall well, we like say. 
I can see how these many media appearances might have undercut the core argument of your appearance on the episode, which is about <laughs> the paucity of people like yourself on, on mainstream <laughs> news. So, <laughs> but I, I suspect that the two are true at the same moment. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I understand you correctly, um, yes, I, I, it, I'm not sure if I understand your, your question, but uh, certainly it has been a pleasure doing these roles because it has had positive representation of various groups and it's given me insight into something different, something new. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Saida said a wonderful thing also during the episode, Dr. Uh, Ramsey, where she said, you know, she gets to, she, which she was saying something she's been wanting to say uh, in public for a very long time. And I wondered if there was something that you've been waiting to say in public for a very long time that you, that you haven't had a chance to, or that you got a chance to uh, in the episode this week. Uh, I don't really censor myself too much. So <laughs> I think I said it all actually, uh, you know, but um the thing I'd like to, to uh, place in the uh, conversation here uh, that's juxtaposed or uh, in congruence with the idea of people being in the media, you know, artists being in the media, that as a musician, I often think about uh, the musicians who have never been necessarily mass mediated, yet they play such an important role in the communities that we we live in for instance uh when if just to extend this uh, idea of the joy and the pain of it if you're a just the, the the regular church musician you know you have to play for the baby shower as well as play for the funeral of, oftentimes of someone you knew and when you step into that role you have to understand what your position is why you're there and even though you may be experiencing all of the grief that uh, you know that the family and close friends are are uh, experiencing, your job and there are musicians who do this every week is to channel the peace and the joy of that situation, honor the pain and the grief that people are going to, and hold those two things in uh, in concert. So uh, that's the kind of work that musicians do all the time. And it's not necessarily the ones who are lucky enough to get the huge record deal and to be enjoyed by people around the world. So uh, just as a historian and as a musician myself, I always keep those two things in balance that, you know, if I write an article about Beyonce, that's going to get me a lot more clicks because people know who that is. But if I write about uh, the more everyday uh, acts of of uh, you know music making, it's a it's another thing. But it for me, it's equally important. How about you, Sarah? As you as you think about all this, I mean, it is such a challenge. What what Dr. Ramsey just mentioned, we all know in the media. You know, if you go where the clickbait is. You get attention that you don't if you're doing the cutting edge reporting that you know needs to be done for our democracy and our justice struggle. Um, how do you balance that at WURD? And then, and then your turn, host away. <laughs> um, I think that that's, that's really the, the holy grail and in, in media. And I, I think that when you're talking about independent media, so URL is this network of, of uh, eight, media organizations that are owned um, by black and brown people. And so we have the opportunity and the freedom to cover things that are not just about clickbait, that are not just, it bleed, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, we are operating in a space that is um, really trying to tell the full story of our communities, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so, um, we, we try and, and, and I know for, for us at WURD, we are always striving to balance out, as I said earlier, balance out kind of the, the heaviness and the intensity of systemic racism and all the manifestations of that, that disproportionately impact black people. Philadelphia is the poorest big city in the country. And so there's, a, there are a lot of challenges, but there's also all of this amazing 
stuff. There's amazing art. There's amazing music and food and 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 just things that allow us to be aspirational. And so we have this responsibility and this um, this opportunity to to tell all of those stories. It's not just about um, telling one side of our experience. And so I think that that's um that's that's why independent media is so important. Um, as you know, Laura, because you're in that space as yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't help feeling that we got a huge endorsement this week with the results of the primary race in Buffalo, New York, where you have a, 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 a woman who has been a longtime activist, first got pregnant at 14 years old, single mom, put in a you know, young mother's home to, to have her first kid, goes to school, get, getting her GED when she has premature twins, decides that she's going to become a NIC unit nurse in the unit where she, her kids were saved. Um, and then when she gets that qualification, she realizes the very institution, the hospital that she's being paid by and employed by is so gentrifying the neighborhood her community live in that they can't afford the rent anymore. And then she organizes a community land trust. This is the person who just mounted this long shot campaign for, to run for mayor of Buffalo on an out socialist platform and won. And we featured her in, in a show a year and a bit ago. I first met her years back. Um, she launched her campaign, as I mentioned in the closing, at the watch party for the premiere in Buffalo of her episode. Um, and, and she said to me, what a difference it makes to see herself reflected in her wholeness in some way that she could recognize and to have her community see her. We're by no means the only people that have covered her, but we covered her first um, at the national level. Uh, she ran for office in part because she was inspired and could see herself in that role. And that's what media does, I think. And, and music and culture puts us in places that maybe we're not yet in real life, but, but could be. Um, yeah. So I was also super, I mean, I've been super, you know, sort of pumped by that all week. Um, but as you pointed out, Dr. Ramsey, it's also a very vulnerable spot uh, when you bring your, when you get some visibility. And she's got to fight still to actually become mayor elect because I can't imagine the establishment, the very Cuomo related establishment in Buffalo is gonna let this victory stand quite as simply as it seems right now. I don't know, any thoughts? Who wants to jump in? Uh, can Dr. I, Ramsey, I, I, oh, can that Sarah? I just, can I pose a question to, to both um, Dr. Ramsey and, and Saida? Because I, what you're talking about, and, and I've been talking about this a lot for some reason this week is access. Yeah. You know, like, like when you, um, you don't necessarily have to have all the money in the world, but if you have power is also about giving people access and opening doors. And, and so when I think about, um, you know, music and film and art and culture for so long, those, the access was denied black and brown people in terms of being able to tell our own stories, even though we always did it, we always made a way. And so I want to throw it to you, um, Dr. Ramsey, you know, like what has your experience been in terms of, you know, you're a professor, you're a musician, you're all of these things, grooming the next generation and creating access points for the future, passing on that knowledge, but also allowing space for them to create their own and bring their own kind of creativity and uniqueness to this work. Oh, what a great question. Uh, I was just having a conversation earlier today with someone. Uh, as I prepare, I, I think I have three more days as a professor of music at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. I'm counting down. Not that I'm counting down, but I'm counting down. But uh, I, I was telling him that, you know, I have to think about what it is that I'm giving up and why am I doing this? Because I'm retiring, you know, on the young side. But uh, my view of myself when I came in the field, which is a very, very white field, music history, okay? And uh, I've always been the first to get the degree from the institution, the first hired and you know, position I've been in. And I came out of the gates, you know, with a lot of fire and I would write what I wanted to write and not really pay attention to how it came across. And it did give you, it got me some uh, visibility. 
But as I progressed in the field, I had to start thinking about those younger people that I was mentoring, that if I was just f- full of you know, fire and brimstone, that I could not advocate properly for younger people. So whereas people, the, some of the young mentors, you know, hundreds, perhaps thousands, look at me as a symbol of how to be free in the field, I myself deeply know that I have hit, I have not said everything that I wanted to say because there is a responsibility when you get that visibility that there's no way that I can, you know, get into a tangle with someone at a a conference and then turn around and write a strong letter of a recommendation that I want them to read and put somebody else on. So I've always had to balance that. And uh, we'll see what happens now if my mouth gets bigger, you know, <laughs> July 1, if I start that. But you're, you're absolutely right to bring in that question about the younger generation. The other thing I would say also is that I have to know that the younger generation is not going to do it like I did it. And what they need from me is there's my support and not my competition. I do not compete with younger people. I'm there to support them. And I'll just leave it there. <laughs> So you may want to jump in on this. No, I would. um, I want to tell you about some things that I have been reporting on and have learned in the past few months about what's happening with Latinos in uh, entertainment. One, let's start with the Sundance uh, Institute. Uh, There is a new document pro actually and to bring in more people of color, to diversify, to give them the mentoring and support that they need, filmmakers of color. The other is uh, actually an interview that I just did a few days ago with a new organization, a new company called Redefine Entertainment. And it's owned by three people, two of whom are Latinos. And one of the things that they talked about was that they are mentoring, they are uh, actually holding classes or one-on-one sessions with these uh, storytellers. They are not necessarily people in front of the camera. These are people telling the stories, the producers, the directors, the writers, and they're representing them. They have a pretty, a uh, pretty large roster of people. Uh, some of, of these individuals are doing some great work uh, that will be coming out in the future, but they are saying, you know, agents get you work, but what we're doing is showing them the way. And these two individuals are actually one of the few people of color in Hollywood who've been through the system. They're actually young, they're under 40, and they realize the value of mentoring because for far too long in Hollywood, you've had, you know, the family system, you're, you're, you know, your father, your uncle was in the business, and that's how you've learned. And for a lot of people of color, we just don't have that. We don't have that support system. So there's greater recognition of the need for that, for people to progress and tell their own stories and gain the access that they deserve to have. Mm -hmm. Do you feel you have wonderful mentors, Sarah? How's how's the world of of Black-owned radio? Um, I mean, I feel like it's, and I, maybe Guthrie feels similarly. I mean, I feel like I'm at that point in my life where I've gone from like um, student to teacher. And, um, you know, I have absolutely had amazing mentors in my life. Um, but I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm pivoting right now to be more of a mentor to, to others. And, and, you know, I really look at mentorship as, you know, opening doors and just, um, and like, like you said, um, Guthrie, like just support and creating opportunities because one of the things that I'm most proud of with, with Word, with WURD and, and what we intend to do with URL is, you know, there are a lot of places where black and brown talent cannot get opportunities. They do not get put on as you, as you said, um, Dr. Ramsey. They, because it is this, um, there's a very rigid kind of um, resume that you have to have. You have to go through a certain kind of farm system. And so I really believe that we as, as black and brown owned operators in media need to have a different you know, lens and be looking at other kinds of skills and experiences that, are, um, that, that give people opportunities to hone their craft and to experiment and, and, and to learn and to grow. And 
that to me is um, is really powerful. And so I'm I'm looking to to mentor young people through my organization and through URL. Well, yeah, I, yeah, so I wanted to mention a couple of things that are happening in Los Angeles. It was just announced. You, you mentioned about last week. Well, I understand that George Clooney is getting together with a variety of different movie stars, and they're starting a mentoring an actual educational program here in downtown Los Angeles for people to learn how to make their own stories and to you know do the film, all everything, the production, the storytelling. This is a new thing uh, that has just come out. And uh, prior to that, Edward James Olmos has also uh, had a youth, uh, I, believe, I believe it's called Youth Cinema Project, something like that, where he is actually supporting uh, young people to tell their own stories. So that's the kind of thing, you know, all of us wish we had had, wasn't, wasn't around when I was coming up, but I'm glad that it's finally there. So the George Clooney uh, and a couple of other people, I believe uh, Eva Longoria, and uh, a few African-American actors uh, are also part of this. Well, I think that's not a bad note to end on. Um, and folks continue to give us your uh, liberation protest um, songs in, in the chat if you want or in direct messaging. You can follow everybody represented here in social media and I hope that you will. And I think that's just the project that we're all engaged in, right? Is trying to institutionalize the change that we've wrought in the world, in the media world, by hook and by crook, with a bit of blood, sweat, and tears, um, but also to to issue in new people and new generations, new demographics, new folks, and we're just I'm just anyway kind of holding hope that the next generations, those who are coming in now to the institutions that we've helped to build, um, will continue to do things differently. That that we don't fall into the kind of rut that you see, that we that we were aware of when we came in, uh, with the same kind of gatekeepers, maybe of different complexions. Um, we need media that keeps stirring things up, mixing things up, and that's why I'm, everyone at the Laura Flanders Show is thrilled to be working with URL. Excited to see what's coming out of URL. The only thing I would ask is that people spread the word. You know, the one thing none of us has is a great PR firm. So um, I mean, maybe. I should just speak for myself. The one thing we don't have is a great PR firm. Uh, so each one talk one, each one bring one to these chats, to these conversations, to this programming, to the members of URL Media and to the Laura Flanders Show. It's really always a joy to be with you. And, and I look forward to the next time. Thanks, Sarah. Any Thank you, Laura. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.